This is America on the Road, winner of the International Automotive Media Conference Gold Medal Award for Radio, and now in our 24th year on the air. Thanks for being with us as we bring you the latest automotive information from around the world. America on the Road is brought to you by DrivingToday.com and the Coalition for Vehicle Choice. I'm Jack Nierad. With me is Chris Teague. How you doing, Chris? Doing pretty well today. Quite busy, which is always a welcome thing these days. Busy is good, and yet you're in Maine. It's summer. I, you know, Maine in summer is a blast, and I don't think you're too far from the coast. And you know, there's all kinds of recreational activities there. How do you keep from you know wanting to go outside all the time? <laughs> well, the humidity and the bugs do a good job of uh, quelling that interest. Uh, but you know, we do spend most of the weekend at the beach, so it, it can't can't complain too much about that. Yeah, no, that sounds terrific. Uh, I, on the other hand, am on the uh, west coast of the United States in California, South Bay and uh, Los Angeles area, uh, where it's a little cloudy. I think the sun might be peeking through today, but uh, a little bit cloudy. We have coastal fog, which is uh, uncharacteristic at this time of year in in late July, but uh, I think it'll burn off and we'll have something pretty. So that's what's going on coast to coast with America on the Road. And uh, of course, Chris writes for Forbes.com and DrivingToday.com and a bunch of other things. And I think maybe uh, another thing to announce. What have you got going that, w- that way, Chris? I just started this week uh, full-time as a journalist with Ford Authority, covering everything Ford-related. So uh, I'll still be doing most of my other work, but this will take over a, a large portion of my, my daytime. Uh, very excited about that. Yeah, well, good for you, and congratulations to you. Of course, Ford Authority is independent of Ford, I think. Uh, is it not? <laughs> it is, although some people confuse the two sometimes. It's, uh, it's an interesting balance to watch. Right, right. Well, I think you're enthusiastic about Ford if you write for Ford Authority, and at the same time, you take a journalistic bent, and that's what we do here. We're enthusiastic about the cars we drive, uh, but we also want to give you the best information about them and help you make good buying decisions and just understand the industry better. So that's our goal. In the road test segment, we're going to be looking at the Mazda, Mazda 6, and I am not being redundant there. That actually is the formal name of the Mazda 6. Uh, Mazda is the brand, and then Mazda 6 is the model. And uh, what were you driving, Chris? The Ford F-250 trimmer, completely unrelated to my new job, but it's uh, a gigantic pickup truck that's uh, a little bit like the Raptor, but very much super duty all the way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that. I was just writing a piece for J.D. Power and Associates about uh, towing and talked a lot about the Ford Heavy Duties, so we'll go into that a little later. Going on kind of in that vein, our guest today is Dave Rivers. He is the Ford SUV marketing manager. Uh, we'll be talking about Bronco. Um, it's not that we're the, <laughs> the Ford house organ here, but Ford has a lot going on this summer, and uh, the Bronco is uh, maybe the biggest news of the summer. Uh, so we'll talk with him about that and talk at some length about the, the new Bronco and Bronco brand, actually. Uh, there are two or three vehicles, depending on how you look at it, as part of Bronco. So we'll talk with Dave Rivers about that. Before we do any of that, though, let's talk about what's in the news. What's, what's the top story for you? I got really excited about a story, uh, probably not so much that a lot of other people will get excited about it, but... Um, Waymo has worked with Fiat Chrysler Automobiles for a few years now on uh, autonomous uh, rideshare, or I should say more like a taxi service that uses the uh, Chrysler Pacifica minivan. And the recent news is that uh, Waymo and FCA are expanding that relationship now with uh, commercial vehicles, uh, specifically the Ram Promaster van. And I think it's really neat to see this because it goes back uh, and kind of reinforces some of what I've been saying to you and and writing about for a while now is that I think that these sort of controlled route vehicles, so the commercial van, delivery van goes from point A to point B over and over again. Those are the sort of things that autonomous uh, vehicles would be really good at. And I think it's exciting to see it playing out in a a real sense. So I'll be watching that one uh, pretty carefully. Uh, Plus, I just like vans. So, you know, I can't really complain about that. Well, you like vans and you like the Venza. I mean, I'm uh, getting a little <laughs> suspect about which <laughs> my partner here on the show, but I, I guess that's okay. I, you're I didn't allowed say to do that. Vans, I said vans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Let's talk a little bit about what uh, JD Power has put together most recently. They ap- announced their appeal study winners uh, r- very recently, 
And uh, appeal is basically about uh, America's love or individual drivers' love for their vehicles. Initial quality is about stuff that breaks and goes wrong and, and you know, people don't like very much. Appeal is kind of the uh, polar opposite of that. It's what people really like about their vehicles. And uh, so that's an interesting take uh, on what they really like. You know, one of the, the things to come out of it is... Uh, well, go figure, Porsche drivers <laughs> really like their cars. Uh, I can't say as I blame them. Uh, Porsche was the highest ranking brand officially. Actually, Tesla, I think, outpointed them, but it's not officially part of the, of the survey. Tesla, kind of an interesting uh, yin, and, yin, yin and yang there, uh, with um, them essentially being last in initial quality, but first in appeal, first in people being enthusiastic about the vehicles, which I think proves that people will look past some problems uh, and s see the beauty and be excited by the beauty of a particular car. Yeah, we've seen it in other products too. People get really excited about new smartphones, new computers, and look past some of the, the flaws. And, you know, you got to hand it to them. Tesla does make an exciting uh, product. I mean, almost everything they make is uh, good looking and uh, funky, but you know, very exciting compared to some of the sort of standard vehicles we're used to seeing on the road. Right, right. Well, some of the other brands, uh, the luxury brands, it scored very well in the appeal study, which uh, again talks about uh, vehicles that they love, uh, is Lincoln. Lincoln had some launches this year that have really scored, uh, Aviator being among them. Um, so that's good. Uh, Cadillac was right there, BMW and Land Rover. So uh, those are Maybe not too surprising. Uh, maybe Lincoln and Cadillac are a bit of a surprise, but I think people who drive Lincolns, people who drive Cadillacs really like them. Uh, so that makes sense. And then uh, among the uh, mass market brands, Dodge, we've heard that name before. <laughs> we talked about Dodge uh, as related to initial quality. It is also highest in the mass market segment in appeal which is a nice double whammy. I mean, we saw the Tesla was really great in one and not so great in the other. Dodge ranks great in both, so that's fairly interesting. And and Ram, essentially Ram trucks, was second. So uh, you've got to give kudos to uh, Fiat Chrysler today uh, for uh, what they've been able to do in the uh, the appeal study. I agree. It just goes to show you what uh, adding more horsepower and a great interior could do to your brand perception. Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, you know, just your personal life, if you want <laughs> <laughs> want to do that as well. But uh, individual models that scored really well uh, were the Genesis G70, uh, the BMW 7 Series, Cadillac CT6, Dodge Challenger and Ram, as we talked about. Ford Escape and Lincoln Navigator did well for Ford Motor Company. Uh, Honda uh, had some winners with the Odyssey and the Ridgeline. Uh, so uh, a minivan and uh, a very unusual pickup truck. Uh, and Toyota, which scores so well typically in IQS, although not so much uh, this past year, uh, or this year actually, had uh, just one winner, and that's the Toyota CHR. That's surprising. Yeah, and I think if you have a CHR, you must really love it, right? <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know that somebody who didn't love it would buy a car that's styled that way. I think that's one of those where you either, wow, this is great, or hmm. I'm not so sure about that one. <laughs> Love it or hate it. It's very polarizing. Right, right. And Audi scored with the A3. So, uh, you know, those are all vehicles I think that uh, people get excited about. And uh, so it, it does make sense. And I really think that people have an emotional attachment to their car. And uh, I think appeal is where that comes through the most. And you undoubtedly agree. I can tell by your silence that you you agree. I always do. <laughs> and you don't have to. I mean, you can violently disagree or, or violently agree. In my family, we violently agree a lot of times, which leads to fights, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because we're agreeing, but that's the way it goes. Uh, in, uh, yeah, and uh, you might experience yeah. that, and as your children get older, you'll probably experience it even more. <laughs> so be ready. There's very yeah. disagreements. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in our road test segment, back, getting back to cars, uh, in our road test segment, which is coming up, we're going to be looking at the Mazda Mazda 6 and the uh, Ford F-250 trimmer. So stay with us for that. We'll be right back right here on America on the Road with Chris Teague. I'm Jack Nerad, and we're glad you're with us.
Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road. Jack D. Rad back with you, along with Chris Teague. And thanks so much for being with us. It is road test time. And I think two very disparate vehicles this time around. You were driving the Ford F-250 trimmer, and I was driving the Mazda Mazda 6, a very conventional midsize sedan. Tell us all a bit about the uh, that big Ford. Well, first of all, I always giggle. I've giggled consistently since I've heard you saying Mazda Mazda 6 today. So um, it's a little distracting. But uh, the Ford F-250 itself is a super duty pickup truck. So it's uh, heavy duty. It's got more towing and payload capacity. It's a bit bigger than the F-150. Uh, and the trimmer is a new off-road package for this year. Uh, it's a step above the FX4 off-road package. And it's got uh, 18-inch wheels and 35-inch tires and beefier springs and some uh, some neat appearance uh, touches on the outside. Uh, it sits about two inches higher than a normal Super Duty pickup truck, which if you've ever stood next to one, um, it's already quite large. So um, I'm six feet tall and the hood comes above my shoulders uh, on the trimmer. Um, I tested the King Ranch. How is it to get in? Uh-huh. Uh, do you, you need a step ladder to get in it? The, I think they provide, or there's an optional step uh, step rail on the side, but the uh, King Ranch trim I tested had power folding uh, steps on the side. So uh, the kids really like that. Open the door and the step folds down, shut the door, the step folds up. And uh, I guess eventually that would wear out after my kids open and close the door a thousand times. But um, it worked. Uh, it's a very tall, very big truck. And you feel all that mass uh, when you're driving down the road. I generally love to heap praise on Ford for their trucks. I think they, they tend to shrink around you as you're driving them. They don't feel as big as they actually are. But this is absolutely one of those vehicles that looks and feels every bit as big as it, as it actually is. So um, the standard engine in the F-250 is a 6.2 liter V8, but mine had the optional 7.3 liter V8, which is 445 cubic inches. It's quite large. That's old school muscle car numbers. Um, and it sounded great. It's an extremely comfortable truck. Uh, I just think I struggled to find a, the person that would buy it and actually need it. I know a lot of people buy Super Duty pickup trucks and customize them with lift kits and big wheels and, and funky exhausts. But this kind of has all that from the factory and it's got a warranty. So that, that's a big thing. But someone who actually needs the capability of a Super Duty, but also needs the off-road, extreme off-road ability that the uh, trimmer package brings. I struggle to find the, the, the need for it, but I think it's a, an attractive package for the buyer that would probably take that truck and do it on their own. Yeah, you know, I don't think anybody gets it unless they want to tow a via, uh, tow something, you know, tow a big trailer, tow a boat, just something. Uh, I think most of the heavy duties tow uh, a considerable portion of the, their lives. That's why you would get one versus a light duty pickup, I think. I agree. And I could see a situation where, you know, someone has a job site or goes to job sites that are way out in the wilderness or in the woods. And this would be a great addition for them. But uh, for me, I'll take my F-250 in standard flavor um, or not at all, because uh, I don't have a need for a pickup truck. <laughs> but I do like the the Super Duty line in general. Well, a lot to like about it. I think what, one of the most interesting things about the Super Duties is how comfortable they are. Uh, although there is that mass that you talk about, you know, you, you realize you're driving a vehicle that, that seems like, I, I kind of always seem like I'm in the cab of a, uh, a school bus or something like that. I'm the school bus driver. Uh, it just seems so massive and you seem so high up in the air. Yeah. You know, sometimes you pull up to an ATM and you kind of miss a little bit and you have to open the door and reach out because you're too far away. Well, this one, I was close enough. I was just too tall. So I had to actually climb out to reach down to the, the slot to stick my card. And it's, I'm sure people behind me were either very irritated or laughing hysterically. But uh, it's just very, very tall and very big. Um, but there is a market for it. Obviously, Ford thinks that uh, they wouldn't have released it. Um, and it's a good-looking truck. I mean, the, the, the Super Duty line, the Ford trucks in general are good-looking, quite handsome already. So <clears throat> this adds the, the big black wheels and tires. It just makes it stand out even more. Right. And they're certainly selling well. I mean, Ford has a lot of incentives on a lot of its vehicles, including the F-150. Of course, there's going to be a new 2021 F-150 imminent, so that maybe makes sense. But there's not much in, in terms of incentives on the uh, on the Super Duties, and I think that's a testament to the fact that uh, they're selling very, very well, and they, they don't need those incentives. <laughs> Agreed. 
So let's talk about a, a vehicle that you might think it's, uh, until you drive it, I think you might think the Mazda 6 is a uh, fairly mundane, just midsize sedan and nothing remarkable. And then you drive one and you see that it is distinct from virtually all the others. And we're talking about really good vehicles like the uh, Toyota Camry and Honda Accord, uh, the Nissan Altima. Uh, are all in that same class, and those are those are nice vehicles. But there's something about the Mazda 6, and I think it's it has a lot to do with um, its its handling abilities, um, and to some extent its power that just separates it from those vehicles. I, I sat behind the wheel, cranked it up, took off, and I went from the get go. This is really nice. I like this vehicle a lot, and that is. Something that I felt for years and years, and I'm certainly not alone in that, feeling that about Mazda 6 and Mazdas in general versus um, somewhat the more run-of-the-mill cars. Certainly Mazdas do not sell in the numbers that uh, Toyota Camrys do or uh, Honda Accords do, Uh, but a lot to like about it. One of the things I particularly liked about it was the 2.5-liter four-cylinder engine, uh, turbocharged, that uh, gives it much more get-up-and-go pretty significant horsepower there, and that always makes you feel good when you have that added power. At least that's something I, I enjoy, and I imagine you do too, Chris. <laughs> um, and then the, just the overall way it feels. Um, it it handles really well, and yet it doesn't beat you up. Um, plenty of room for five passengers, as you would expect in a midsize vehicle. A lot of uh, opportunity to upgrade. You can get an 11-speaker Bose premium audio system. Uh, satellite radio, paddle shifters, a bunch of stuff. Um, you can even get this 360-degree camera to, uh, along with parking sensors to help you park, which is advantageous as I'm parking near my little picket fence up in front of my house. And it has navigation with traffic sign recognition, so you could see what you're ignoring uh, just right there on the dash. Just a, a lot to like about this car, and I, I think there is a bit of premium to it. I, what's your take on that, Chris? I agree. Where Mazda wins for me is in the interior, the upscale nature of their interior, the fit and the finish. Um, You know, you mentioned they don't sell in the numbers of a a Toyota Camry or a Honda Accord with the Mazda 6. But uh, even in their base trim levels, their vehicles feel more premium, more expensive and more upscale than they probably really are in, in actuality. And then also the driving experience, as you said, you know, it handles well. Um, it's got great acceleration and I found those same characteristics to be true of their crossovers, right? So the, uh, the CX-9, even for being a large crossover, uh, handled well as a quite a fun driving experience for a family vehicle. So they, they went on those two points. I think they've got, they definitely got something there. Right, right. And I would say even in standard trim with 187 horsepower out of a normally aspirated 2.5 liter four cylinder, you'd be fine. And most people will never need that added horsepower. But when you get the uh, 250 horsepower, the turbocharged version, well, it's just that much better. It has a six speed automatic transmission with gears, um, not a CVT, not a continuously variable transmission. So that adds to the sportiness. And just the all-around feel, the all-around looks, um, the way it behaves inside. I mean, it has a an infotainment system that probably takes some getting used to. Uh, but once you do get used to it, it, it works pretty well. And now it has Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, so uh, that makes things better. Um, I think all around, it's it's certainly, if you're looking for a midsize vehicle and you like to drive at all, you like uh, driving for enjoyment, uh, the Mazda 6 is certainly one to take a look at. I will violently agree with you there. Good. Jeez, you're, you're so agreeable. Uh, you know, no wonder I like doing the show with you, Chris. I, you just <laughs> agree with all my silly ideas, which are not so silly in this case. Um, when we come back, we will be taking listener questions. So uh, if you have a listener question, you can easily reach us by sending your question to editor at drivingtoday.com, editor at drivingtoday.com. And we'll answer your question on an upcoming show and uh, listen for the uh, listener questions when we come back. So stay with us with Chris Teague. This is Jack Nerad, and you're listening to America on the Road. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road with Chris Teague. This is Jack Nerad back with you, and it is question and answer time on America on the Road, a segment we like doing. Uh, We learn a lot. We have to learn a lot as we write about all these cars. 
you know, 24-7, 365, which is about what the life of a, a freelance writer is like uh, in the car business. And uh, we're happy to impart that information, to deliver that information to you via this podcast and radio show. Uh, and speaking of that, here is a question that we've got, and a question for you, Chris. We talk a lot about crossovers on the show. The listener asks, what crossover would you recommend? I'm particularly uh, concerned about fuel economy. So what are your thoughts there? I have three in mind with this question, Jack, and I think it comes down to hybrid versus uh, gas-powered for me. So Toyota has a RAV4 hybrid and then soon to be RAV4 Prime, uh, which I believe is a plug-in hybrid. I could be wrong. And then that is. the Honda, no, is. Honda CRV uh, has a hybrid via, uh, trim as well. And then uh, last is the Ford Escape hybrid, which made its return uh, for 2020. So all three of those have fuel economy on the highway or combined fuel economy above 30 miles per gallon, some of them uh, closer to 40 miles per gallon. And if you look at a traditional crossover uh, RAV4, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but they're significantly less. And you don't give up a lot in terms of driving experience with a hybrid in the crossover. Uh, in fact, the, the CRV hybrid- Yeah, quite the opposite, really. I think yeah, they're better. Exactly. The, the CRV hybrid uh, that I'm testing this week is more refined in many ways than the standard CRV that I tested just a couple of weeks ago. So uh, I think those three, uh, there will be a little bit of a price markup uh, up front. But you'll probably get that back on the the back end, especially if you're you're driving a lot. Well, and yeah, and maybe you will. I, and, and that's the question. And is the question you want to you're concerned about fuel economy or you want to save money? Because they're two two separate things. And I would say if you want to save money, you'd buy the standard version. You wouldn't buy a hybrid version and pay that extra, unless you were going to have that vehicle for years and years and years and years. Because I think the payback period would be pretty high, especially when gas gasoline is as, as cheap as it is now. On the other hand, there's some people, and uh, you know, God bless them, who care about fuel economy for fuel economy's sake, burning less fossil fuel, and uh, it's a, that's a different argument and a, and a different question, and I think we've kind of answered both. Totally agree, but I have a question for you now, Jack. Uh, yes, I like that. As it relates to towing, so it's summer, we're all wishing we had boats, but for those of us that are lucky enough to have one, what's the best vehicle to tow a small boat? Well, part of the question is how small... Uh, but let's say you've got a fishing boat or a bass boat or something that weighs less than 2,000 pounds, something like that. You have a, a wide variety of choices, including the vehicles we just talked about. I think, you know, both the RAV4 and uh, the uh, Honda CRV uh, would certainly tow a, a boat that small. Uh, what you have to keep in mind when you're towing a boat is you're not only towing the boat, but you're towing the weight of the trailer. And then you're towing the weight of the gear that you either put in the vehicle or put in the boat. Um, so it, it gets to be larger than you think the, the weight of the boat is. Um, and I would say going a step up, I would look at things like the uh, Hyundai Palisade. Uh, it tows about 5,000 pounds uh, and is very robust in, in what it does in terms of towing. Uh, some vehicles have a tow rating uh, that is incumbent upon you having a lot of stuff <laughs> that you've added to the vehicle. Uh, whereas with the Palisade, uh, largely uh, 5,000 pounds is what you get. And that's going to tow uh, a significant cross-section of boats. Uh, it's not going to tow a big cabin cruiser or something you would use, uh, say, a Super Duty uh, Ford pickup truck to tow. Uh, but it will tow a, a wide variety of things. I think some other good ones um, would be the Dodge Durango. That's kind of an old school midsize SUV and uh, it has a pretty big tow rating, actually, uh, something around 7,000 pounds if memory serves. So those are pretty good choices, I think. Great. I'll look for one as soon as I convince my wife to buy a boat, which may never. So what kind of boat would you like to buy, Chris? I would just like a bass boat. I think that would be great for the lakes here. It's uh, kind of a shallow, not too fast boat with a trolling motor in front. You probably could tell I don't know that much about boats, despite the fact that I can almost throw a rock into the ocean. Well, it sounds like you know something about bass boats. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that would be cool to have a bass boat. I've never had a bass boat. I've had uh, a string of sailboats through the years. And... Uh, those are <laughs> kind of difficult to tow, depending. Uh, so there you go. 
But uh, boating is great, and uh, Maine is great, so I envy you. When we come back, we will be talking with Dave Rivers, who, when I talked with Dave, was in uh, Moab, Utah, which is another enviable place to be. He is the Ford SUV marketing manager, and he'll be talking with us about Bronco, the new launch of the Bronco line and the various Bronco vehicles. So stay with us for that. With Chris Teague, this is Jack Nerad, and thanks so much for being with us on America on the Road. Welcome back, everybody, to America on the Road. Jack E. Red back with you, and we have a special guest talking about a really exciting subject. Uh, Dave Rivers is Ford SUV Marketing Manager. Dave, number one, thanks for being with us. We do appreciate it. Well, thanks, Jack. Uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate uh, the invitation, and I uh, can't wait to, to share with you a topic that is just top of mind for us at Ford right now. Well, it's top of mind not for just people at Ford, but I think across the whole auto industry, you kind of took it by storm with the the launch of Bronco uh, as a brand and uh, three different vehicles. Uh, why don't we start talking a bit about the brand, about uh, what you're trying to accomplish with Bronco? Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. We we uh, we love it. We love to start there. So um, Ford uh, launched. Uh, it's been about. A little over 10 days now ago, we started talking about Bronco as a brand and a brand family. And if you think back to the 1960s, so actually we hold August 11th, 1965 as a really important date in Ford's history because that's when we launched the original Bronco as a 1966 model. And at the time, we positioned it as a the, the first uh, uh 4x4 sports car blazing a new trail of excitement. And if you think about that time period, Americana in the 60s, folks were looking for something a little bit different from the station wagons and the sedans they were driving. They wanted something that had a bit more of an outdoor adventure to it. And, uh, you know, Bronco fit perfectly in the hearts and minds of America back then. So it, it fit really well with the times. Ford had the, the original pony car already running wild with the Mustang. And a year or so later, uh, you know, Bronco was born. And, you know, it shared some of the same spirit and love of the outdoors, you know, open air with the, the doors and the roof off. And it came in three different styles. It was a, uh, a sport utility vehicle, which was a bit more like a pickup. It was a wagon, which was sort of the to go anywhere, do anything, carry all, uh, to get, you know, families to and from town and then, you know, allow you to go off road if you wanted to. And then there was a roadster and, uh, that spirit was kept alive through five generations up until 1996, where we put Bronco, you know, we, we let it sunset for a bit, but I'll tell you, the enthusiasm only grew and that enthusiasm spawned from a couple of folks that, you know, restored original, uh, you know, 60s through the five generation Broncos and really, really encouraged the company to bring it back. And, you know, we've had a team of folks working underground for a few years now, and I've been fortunate for the last couple of years to be part of that, that program. And what we saw is a huge opportunity where there's been this tremendous growth in SUVs where folks you know, are, are gravitating a lot more to SUVs, but what we've also seen is a double-digit growth in the in the rugged utility space. And part of the reason for that is, in many respects, a lot of SUVs have lost their personality. You know, they they've uh, become just sort of bigger station wagons, is what some some you know consumers have referred to them as. And I think what Bronco does for us is it hits a real sweet spot where it offers something very very true to its heritage. Uh, this this original, you know, uh, wild horse back in the 60s done in a really new, interesting, and modern way. And I'll love to touch on that here in a minute. But just to, to kind of round out the bit about Ford being, or being a, a brand reborn from where we left off, you know, we, we saw this huge growth. And we said, maybe, maybe there's an opportunity for more than just one original vehicle, which was the two-door, you know, and, and giving a choice of consumers. So, you know, as a brand family, we launched the two-door, which is the iconic, you know, very true to the original 1966. Uh, the four-door, which offers those that need a little bit more space and cargo carrying and people carrying capability. 
and then the Broncos Sport, which is what we call the Bronco, Broncos small SUVs. Because, you know, the small SUV category is one of the largest, if not the largest, in the industry. And so we've positioned Bronco really, really well across the landscape. And, you know, it's a, so it's a, it's a family of products. And with that family comes what we call uh, built wild DNA. And that's born from a whole lot of things, but every Bronco is built wild. And if you think about Ford's history with built Ford Tough F series, you know, we borrow from and, and have drafted off the core principles of what make, make F series as tough as they are. Right. And, and, and really in a lot of ways, Dave, your, your heritage goes even farther back. I'm, I'm going to bring up what might be oh, a, yeah. a four-letter word for you, but I think it's going to work in your favor. And the word is Jeep. And the interesting thing is that uh-huh. Ford built a lot of Jeeps uh, during World War II, and maybe it was the biggest producer of Jeep. Yeah. Uh, so your heritage in this field goes way, way back and uh, is associated with that, that brand. And, and now, uh, and certainly Bronco has been a brand of uh, 50 years running that uh, has its, its own heritage. For sure it does. And I'm glad you, you, you allowed me just to gravitate back to that time period. So, you know, when, when the government commissioned a few different manufacturers to make military vehicles, and stepped up. And that's just kind of been who we are and what we're about as a, as a, a family-owned company uh, with the Ford family, obviously still very involved. But we've always been, been there when, you know, the government said, hey, we need somebody to build these types of, of smaller military vehicles and became uh, military Jeep vehicle was the design was was very much true to, to Ford being a leader in that design, and uh, you know made, we made thousands of them. Um, and then you know not not to get too far into history, but if you think back to you know when World War II ended, and those folk the, the military GIs, let's say men and women that came back from from World War II, by the time the '60s rolled around, they're hitting sort of a middle age stage in life. And they were the sort of the spawning of this new world of adventure, you know, and the adventure of, I don't really necessarily want a sedan or a wagon. I want something a little bit different. So they started to convert these old military vehicles into, you know, these off-roading outdoorsy type vehicles. And and that's again, where we saw this opportunity uh, also a little bit of history about Bronco in that, that time period. Originally, it was codenamed, we, we codename all of our vehicles, but it was codenamed uh, GOAT, you know, G-O-A-T, GOAT. So many people think of it as the, the acronym for greatest of all time. But for us, that holds a special meaning for us where it is, it was codenamed that because it was the goes over any terrain vehicle. And if you think about what it was meant to do, it needed to have tremendous capability, you know, because... People would, would want to, you know, go do some outdoor activity, out, some off-road activity. They'd take it to their ranches or they'd work the farm, you know, or the, uh, the service station owner would, would push snow with it in the in wintertime. And so it needed, it had the, the, the four-wheel drive, it had a transfer case to it, so it, it needed that real strong capability, um, you know, from a, a suspension architecture, from a transfer case, you know, it had a really great breakover angle, it had a really strong um, or a high approach and departure angle, you know, so it sort of set this new standard. Right. To be, it was, it borrowed some of the heritage of Mustang that came up with this whole idea of a four wheel drive sports car blazing a new trail. And uh, so tremendous history there, Jack. Right. Well, and uh, you know, such a utilitarian vehicle and the utilitarian nature of it really drives the styling. And I think drives the styling uh, of the new Bronco models as well. Why don't you talk a bit about that? Because, I, I mean, that's a separator, I think. For sure. Yeah, it really is. And, and, you know, as much as we've become used to modern technology, and so um, so the, the utilitarianism of, of a Bronco was, was really was a mainstay. It was, it was sort of a critical element of what it was back then in that it was purpose-built, you know, the, the design was, was purposeful, meaning the flat surfaces didn't have a lot of extra flair. And if you think about it, too, there's a lot of vehicles back then that were designed with extra flair to them, or they, were ex- they, had, they had extra wings, or they had extra slopes. And, you know, the, the Bronco was designed with a flat form in mind, 
You know, it had flat fenders. It had a one-piece cartridge-style grill with the round headlights. It had a flat hood and an upright windscreen. And, you know, of course, removable top and doors. And, and that's all these folks really wanted. Um, and I, you know, as we we'll, we'll transition, I'm sure here shortly. But but if you think about the Bronco of what we brought back, our designers, Paul Race and his design team, they listened to all of that of what people loved about the original. You know, the fact that it had to be purpose built, that it had to retain characteristics of utilitarianism. You know, that it was it, there was there was no fluff, there was nothing extra. It, that's what made a Bronco a Bronco. Right. You know, and and. Frankly, as we move through generations, in many respects, started to add those conveniences, and and then you know it may have lost its way a little bit as it got to that fifth generation. Well, it, it seems now like uh, if anything, the designers have taken that utilitarianism uh, one, two, or three steps farther. They've they've done things like removable doors that then can be stowed uh, in the back. Uh, you know, they mounted the mirrors to the A pillar instead of the doors, so they can, you know, stay stay with the vehicle as opposed to being stowed with the doors. Those kind of things. Talk a bit about that stuff, would you? Yeah, yeah, no, I, absolutely. And, and part of that, you know, listen, the, the Bronco is designed for the consumer, and if there's ever been a better example, this is it. Or this, there isn't a better example within Ford of, of where the design team really put in place human centered design. You know, and at its core, we we peeled back what the pain points were that customers were dealing with or are dealing with today with a vehicle or or their their lifestyle choice of vehicle to go off roading or enjoy the outdoors. You know, so things like you know modularity. I want to change out to make it my own. That is a critical element of a vehicle like this, and and as a result, the design team has designed modularity into the vehicle. You know, the, the panels all are easily changeable. The the grill is a one-piece grill still. So, you know, Paul and the team, they scanned one of our chief designers, original 1966 Bronco, into their system. They studied every angle of the original vehicle. And they said, okay, how can we make it better? How can we retain a lot of its original characteristics so the flat forms are all still there? You know, you mentioned things like, the, the uh, rear view mirrors being mounted to the towel rather than to the doors. Well, what does that allow for? Well, a huge pain point is I take my doors off and I've just lost the ability to see behind me. That's a problem. You know, so we, the, the design team went to work and they said, what if we could mount the mirrors onto the vehicle itself so we still could take the doors off and retain the ability to see? Problem solved. Um, now, what do I do with the doors? Well, if you have frames on them, you know, you can't put them on the vehicle because they're big and bulky and heavy. So I got to chain them to a tree or I leave them in the garage and I just pray it doesn't rain or I got bad weather. You know, if I, I think about places like Denver and the mountains around there where you can go from 70 degrees to a snowstorm, you know, within 24 hours or half a day. You know, and if you get stuck without your doors and your roof, you're, you know, you got a, a bit of a problem. Um, so the Paul and his team said, what if we took the spirit of a Mustang in the doors where we have frameless doors and we have the, the window go down into the door and we make it up a composite material that makes it really light and easy to take off so that someone can do it in just a few minutes. And then what if we could actually store those doors in the back, you know, so that if you do run into a problem, you just pull the doors right out of the back and you put them back on for a few minutes. You know, it's things like that in terms of a very human centered approach to the design of the vehicle that, uh, you know, the, the, the design team painstakingly sweated those details so that when it comes to the execution, just on those, that, that piece itself, the doors and what do I do with the mirrors and how do I, what do I store them? Now I can, I can own a four door and I can store all four doors in the back and I can still really enjoy the experience. I mean, that is what we really consider customer centric first and what I think is going to separate, you know, Bronco as this modern off-road vehicle. Right. And you say off-road, and it certainly it seems like all three vehicles are purpose-built for off-road. I mean, certainly the Sport maybe not quite so much. But at the same time, you definitely resisted what had to be an impulse uh, to make uh, a two-wheel drive version of that, that vehicle, you know, as kind sure. of the, the oh, yeah. uh, 
entry level. Talk a bit about, you, you know, you're thinking and going all four by four all the time. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. Bronco always was four by four. It was, it, there was never a, a different consideration. We said, if we're going to make a Bronco, any Bronco in our portfolio will be a hundred percent four wheel drive. And part of the reason for that is you never know when you're going to need it. And just like you never know when you're going to be in a snowstorm with the doors in the back, you know, you got to have the capability of four wheel drive at all times. So the design team and the engineering team went to work and said, okay, how do we, how do we make this, uh, you know, full-time four wheel drive easy to do on actually both of them. Um, different architectures for sure. I mean, Bronco two and four door born from the second generation architecture of, you know, a Ranger platform, but it's, it's been built specifically for Bronco. Bronco Sport is our C2 platform, our C platform, and it also has been built specifically for Bronco Sport customers. And when you talk about the capability, that we have two different customers that, that we're working with. You know, we have the two and the four door customer where the vehicle itself is the enjoyment. I'm going off road, I'm going to Hell's Revenge, or I'm going to uh, Jackhammer or the King of the Hammers, or I'm going mud mudding in Georgia, uh, or I'm going through deep snow up in northern Michigan or Minnesota. So, you know, I need that capability because I really love to do it in the vehicle. A Bronco Sport customer also needs that same level of capability, uh, but it's different because in many respects, I need the capability to get me to an activity that I love to do. So the Bronco Sport customer wants to load up with kayaks and a, mountain, a couple of mountain bikes, which, by the way, we have very unique storage systems in the Bronco Sport that allow consumers to do that. Put two bikes, you know, I have a $5,000 suspension bike. I could put two of them in the back of a Bronco Sport and stand it up because the team thought through in painstaking detail, you know, the, the what a customer needs, and it's, now you don't want my bikes to get damaged if they're on the back of the of the vehicle. They can go on the back, but they can also go right. inside and I can sort things around. Them. Well, and be a theft target when they're hanging off the back of the vehicle. I mean, that, exactly. that is always a, oh. a, a big problem, especially when you have bikes that are so expensive now, right? Exactly. And, and these people love to do those activities. So they need the capability, Jack, to get to where they're going. You know, they, they, they still need four-wheel drive. They need a twin me- mechanism RDU, which is a rear drive unit, which allows you to engage the, the rear transfer case, you know, on the fly with a Bronco Sport. Because they want to get to the trailhead so I can go do the thing that I love to do, you know. And so each Bronco is designed specifically. That's why we, we've actually put together an off-road capability toolbox, which kind of allows consumers to pick and choose what they want for the type of terrain that they're going to drive on. We've talked about a lot of the vehicle's features, but what are some of the features that excite you most? Where, where do you think you really have some home run differentiated features in, in the vehicles you've got? Yeah, so I touched on doors off roof, off on the two and the four door and the ability to store them. Uh, I touched on, obviously, four wheel drive standard on both. Unique storage systems in the Bronco Sport. You know, it's under seat storage. There's modeling straps on the back of the seat and gear on. I mentioned, uh, you know, we, uh, in a Bronco, we have a, a safari type style roof that gives you that extra storage inside, you know, to put your bikes in. Um, fully accessorized in both. I think my favorite feature is, you know, the ability to trail map real time, you know, downloading maps to your, to your, uh, your vehicle through the Ford Pass performance app. The ability to socially share the content. So let's say I'm I'm driving Hell's Revenge and I just nail this huge this 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 overlook, and I shoot images and I want to share them. I think the what the design and engineering team have given us the ability to do is trail map, coupled with social sharing, you know, through your network, and then separately, you know, their the involvement of what we call our Bronco Nation, you know, and and that is really the power of this and that's the community sharing through giving you the capability to do these incredible rides that go to these great places and then find your way through it and then capture content on the trails and share it real time you know through uh, through your network i think the team's absolutely nailed that and it's going to be really going to be game changing for for those folks especially that are new to this whole world of off-roading and being in the outdoors 
Right, right. Well, and you've alluded to something that, you know, the longer I've been in the business, the more I believe this to be true, that when people buy a car, what they're really doing is they're, they're kind of finding and identifying their tribe. Yeah. And that certainly is, is true with Bronco. Um, yeah, talk a bit about what you think the Bronco tribe is like. Yeah, I would, you know, I would say our tribe is, is extremely inclusive. I mean, Bronco is a family, and we want everybody to participate in it. I mean, there's nothing, I mean, we have this thing, you know, sort of like giddy up or yeehaw. I mean, it's sort of like you own a Bronco, you're part of the family, and we want you to share it with others. Um, we are putting together an off-road driving school uh, in four epic locations so that you can come and use one of our Broncos and learn everything about the vehicle. You can, can bring friends with you, um, and and you can enjoy the Bronco and what it's all about, and then bring it back to your community and, and do more of it in your, you know within where you live. Uh, but we think Bronco is all about you know doing things together, you know, and doing it with uh, with your friends and family. Um, and then you know I would be remiss, Jack, if I didn't just spend a minute on another key separator between us and I think others in this area is. Bronco allows you to do things you love to do with a greater degree of speed while being safe at the same time. And, and part of the reason for that is, is we've got our all eco boost lineup of engines coupled with on the two and the four door, we've got a seven speed manual or a 10 speed auto. Um, and we've got the opportunity through our terrain management system in seven up to seven, what we call goat mode. So dating back to our, our history with, you know, goes over any type of terrain. Uh, but that, that is going to make Brock a different kind of driving experience. And I think once you get in it and you drive and you experience what it's like to do things at a little bit higher rate of speed while being safe at the same time, you're going to want to bring other people with you. You know, you're going to want to do trail maps. You're going to want to use our 360 camera. You're going to want to share your content and you're going to want to do it with friends. And I think that's really in a nutshell what Bronco is all about. Well, it's exciting. It really is. And, and bringing a, a brand or at least a, a strong sub-brand like this to market has got to be very, very exciting. Tell our listeners uh, when they're going to see Bronco in showrooms and how they can participate. So uh, Bronco Sport goes on sale this fall, uh, and Bronco 2 and 4 door uh, go on sale in the spring. Uh, we are open for reservations, and we'd love for all your listeners to join us. Visit Ford.com. You could place a reservation. Uh, it's a hundred dollar deposit. It's fully refundable. Uh, you can reserve anything, but our first edition, those are both sold out for both the two and the four door and the Bronco sport. But we do have uh, open reservations on any of our other series. Uh, we've got really unique names to, to what we call our different series. Um, uh, we borrowed things, like, uh, we're not borrowed, but we've, we've leaned into things like, um, national parks with big bend and, and outer banks and, uh, Badlands, uh, and then we've got a wild track and a black diamond series uh, on two and four door. Um, but you could make your reservation. I'd also encourage uh, your listeners to visit us at BroncoNation.com. Uh, so go to the Bronco Nation. Uh, we'd love for you to participate. Join us. It's a great place to be part of forums, to read blog posts, to to get updates on you know Bronco and be part of the community at the onset. Follow us on Instagram uh, at Bronco or the Bronco Nation, and then also we encourage folks to give us to share with us their information via hand raiser on our Bronco Off Rodeo program. Uh, that's the the day and a half driving experience. If you purchase a Bronco, it comes with your purchase, but we'll take you to one of four epic locations to be able to teach you all about what Bronco is and how do you get the most out of it. Whether you're the novice and you've never done this before and you really want to experience it, we will, uh, you will be feeling like the expert when you leave. If you're the expert, you've done this before, we're going to push you to the limit and, and ensure that you get the most out of what a Bronco can offer. Uh, but we, we love the fact, Jack, that you, uh, you gave us a chance just to catch up with your, your listeners. Um, Bronco is back. We are just super excited as a company. And we want as many people in, all your listeners, we, we just encourage you to join us along this journey, and uh, we can't wait to uh, to have listeners experience it with us. Well, I, I tell you, I can't wait to get behind the wheel and get off-road in, uh, in all of these models. It, it's a blast. I always love doing that, and I, I just can't wait for this. Uh, it's it's really exciting for us all. So uh, Dave Rivers of Ford, uh, 
the Ford SUV marketing manager. Thanks so much for being with us. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, Jack. You gave me goosebumps just with your last remarks there. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I hope so. And uh, stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back right here on America on the Road, or in this case, America Off-Road. And that's our interview with Dave Rivers, uh, the Ford SUV marketing manager, talking about Bronco. Thanks so much to him for uh, chatting with us about that at some length. You can tell how enthusiastic he is about the new Bronco line, and I'm enthusiastic to drive it. Uh, I'm also enthusiastic to thank um, co-host Chris Teague for being with us. Thanks so much, Chris. It's always great speaking with you. I appreciate the enthusiasm, and I will enthusiastically say that Anyone listening, if you like what you heard, you like what we talked about, and uh, you want to help us continue to grow, subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a good rating or a bad one if you want, Uh, but uh, that will help us continue to grow and show up in more searches as uh, we continue to move forward. Yes. And while we're begging for your help here on America on the Road, I would like to let you know that uh, my latest book, The GR Factor, is available at Amazon and you know, all over the place, Barnes and Noble and all that. It's a a book really about uh, management and business and, uh, you know, treating people right. And uh, I think if you enjoy the show, you'd enjoy the GR Factor. So look for that and uh, look for us next time right here on America on the Road with Chris Teague, Jack Nerad with you. And thanks so much for being with us. Please join us again next time. <laughs>